Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks, bringing you the latest news from Taiwan. I'm Betty Chen. I'm Rath Wang. We'll look at what China's new ban on U.S. chip giant Micron means for rising tensions between the two countries, and it announced it right when Washington was hosting IPEF. Joining us are Yan Zhengsheng, National Zhengzhi University Professor of Political Science, Stephen Tan, Managing Director of the International Policy Advisory Group, and Chong Wen Guo, Deputy Editor-in-Chief of United Daily News, one of Taiwan's largest newspapers, who is also an expert in international relations. A warm welcome back to all of you to the show today. Right after the G7 summit in Hiroshima, China announced bans on the import of Micron chips. Chonglun, was this a direct retaliation of the G7 joint statement on Chinese economic coercion? I think um, there's two achievements out of this G7 Hiroshima summit. One is that uh, they emphasize on resilience of supply chain. And that means they will try to guard any sensitive technology from leaking to China or Russia. The other thing would be um, there's a lot of uh, economic harassment coming from China. Uh, we can notice recently is uh, Lithuania and also uh, on um, Australia, so on and so forth. So that is another thing that uh, all the G7 countries have agreed uh, they should have a, a concerted uh, actions. And the reason why China claimed that uh, Micron will be uh, the, the chips that is uh, breaking uh, China security regulation, I think they have chosen a soft target, meaning the Macron is um, mostly our memory chips that can easily be replaced by Korean chips. So that wouldn't hurt Chinese economy that much. And I think that definitely that is uh, a kind of retaliation China is So it's more just like a mini sign to show to the U.S. that, oh, we have our cars as well. Right, right, right. So, Stephen, what is behind the Chinese bans, and do you see, think that there will be more such kind of bans in the future? Well, um, we'll see. I, I think uh, uh, obviously it's a retaliation. <coughs> obviously, it's to, to China, it's a lower hanging fruit, and it's a form of uh, economic coercion. Now, I think the underlying reason for that, we suspect, is that China is jacking up the bargaining chips you know, vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Uh, sanctions and export control restrictions in the next rounds or rounds of the U.S.-China negotiations. Now, uh, I think uh, it's just uh, Mr. Wu just correctly pointed out, uh, it, I think the, the damage for Chinese uh, sanction on Micron is minimum, uh, so it's, it's strategic. Then, of course, you know, right before G7 summit, the announcement uh, further trigger the antagonism, you know, among the uh, G7 groups, not just G7, but other countries, uh, the leaders of which uh, were invited uh, to the G7 summit. So I, I think uh, whether or not there will be a continuous uh, sanctions or, or, or the actions by China of similar nature, I, I think it remains to be seen. But in terms of the technology uh, sanctions, it, it, it's, it's hard to find a, an, an, an co a company or an industry that can fit into the category of the Chinese sanction without hurting China itself. So I think it would be more difficult than not to, to do the follow-up sanctions on other industries. Right, so you're saying there, this has been a very calculated, careful way very, of China. Very, very much in, in my humble view. And, and I, I, I doubt that uh, you know, China would be able to find another company or another industry in, in the tech sector that uh, it can implement and, and place further sanctions without hurting itself or without further hurting more China than helping China in its development uh, you know, of the country going forward. Indeed. Mm -hmm. um, Professor, this just seems as a move on the U.S. Mm -hmm. by China, mm -hmm. even though it's carefully crafted to minimize the damage on mm -hmm. the Chinese economy. But do you feel that tensions are on the rise? Even though President Biden mentioned earlier in the year that um, tensions will decrease and that you know, they will come up to, with some kind of contensus very soon. Well, I personally think that Biden is trying to maintain the dialogue or at least some kind of link with China. But before the 2024 election, he has to act up 
I think after the 2024 election, if he got elected, then maybe a different story. But if you already break up the relations, uh, then you cannot repair them after 2024. So he's just still keeping the line open there. But for China, I think this is uh, the first retaliatory uh, measure taken by, by Beijing uh, because it has taken a lot of sanction uh, against China by the U.S. So they picked Micron. Uh, some people will say, is China already you know, producing, you know, having the capacity to do the same thing? But usually, you know, I think in, in high-tech industry er area, uh, China is buying all these chips, uh, memory chips. And even though if they, it can produce a lot, but sometimes they will pretend that they cannot, but continue to buy, you know, like, oh, they don't have the technology. But I think that's not the case. Okay, so the second, so the first one is, can China, you know, simply replace Micron, you know, Chinese company? I think that's not uh, ready yet. But also, Chong Ren mentioned about, you know, maybe, you know, trying to uh, divide the, 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 the digital world like the U.S. and Korea, uh, because this can, you can buy from Korea as well. But Korea right now is so pro-U.S., especially pre President Yoon, I don't think you know Korea is going to sell Chinese chip without first consulting uh, the the Washington D.C. So that's not the case. So the third one is I think you know China just feel that after you know few years that you have to show something that you know, to convince the people you know we are not just taking all the sanctions by the U.S. But do you and feel this is the only thing, or do you feel there's more to come? As a I, I think Stephen this is symbolic right now. Uh, for China to saying something and then uh, you can continue to keep the dialogue uh, line open. So Chong Lin, so I, I, I think that with a similar way uh, China will be um, have a second thought of uh, banning uh, other technology uh, company but I think China is trying to do something else for instance um, recently um, Elon Musk uh, had visited uh, Shanghai and Beijing and also, we were told that uh, Jason Huang of Huida is also going. I think asking all those big technology CEO going to China is a way that um, Chinese want to uh, surround uh, Biden and the Congress on their own decision making. I mean, by having uh, Jason Huang saying that China is such a huge market, it's re irreplaceable or have uh, Elon Musk having a big um, factory factory opening now in Shanghai. That would be forcing that um, Biden's, uh, now it's uh, Biden tried to um, uh, forbid uh, American high technology invest in China, making it very hard for them to do. I think that is the, how China is doing, uh, try to uh, cut corners and try to force uh, Biden's to drop its original policy. So Zhong Wen, you just mentioned, say, Elon Musk and also uh, Jensen Huang of NVIDIA, they're going to China. Do you think that China can afford not to rely on technology from the U.S. and other democracies? I, I think they cannot. Now uh, the U.S. technology is still uh, the leaders in the world. And if China ever want to move up their economy, move up their industry, they will have to rely on the latest technology. And AI, and uh, an electric car are the top end of the technology right now. Uh, just allow me to ask something. Uh, I think uh, obviously chi China's strategy right now is to create an image and invite the multinational, the leaders of the multinationals, such as Elon Musk, um, you know, and then Jason the uh, Jameson Huang, and then of course uh, uh, Cook of Apple, to visit China, to visit Beijing to create an image to the whole world that is still open up to the market internationally. But uh, whether or not it will pull through, and uh, whether or not Tesla or NVIDIA or Apple will go back to Washington to change their policy, I doubt that. Uh, there's a long-lasting, very stable, uh, sustainable policy in Washington uh, towards or against China right now. 
And I think uh, in terms of the technology sectors, there are two separate chains that's being built up or in the process of being built up right now. That is, you know, uh, China's supply chain and ex-China supply chain. Now, even Jensen Huang of uh, NVIDIA openly uh, admitted that uh, their uh, NVIDIA is actually trying to uh, or has made uh, sort of a, a chip for China or chips for China. So obviously, you, you can see that this is a, the chips for China were made for China. It's on in, a, in the in the China supply chain, and the rest of them is ex-China supply chain. And in the technology world, it's going to be like that, whether you like it or not. Whether it's Apple or TSMC or the uh, chip design companies like like Nvidia, it's going to be that way. So I think uh, by opening, welcoming those leaders, corporate and technology leaders to China and to visit Beijing would not change the reality that uh, at this moment and going forward, the whole world in terms of the supply chain and technology have already been divided into two separate mm -hmm. and, 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 and not uh, integral parts. Yeah. Stephen, uh, speaking of um, technology, mm -hmm. um, we've seen the C919, and is this them, con China, speaking to its domestic audience because they've said that this airplane, China's first commercial passenger jet, is wholly made by China. But if you look at it, more than half or close to 80% are parts from the U.S. and other democracies. It, it's more... So to what my, is this message? To my knowledge, it's more of an assembly, right? It's more of an assembly, you know, putting parts and engines and uh, various things together to make it, you know, locally made or, or China made, uh, you know, aircraft. Um, I, I think in the, in the foreseeable future, I think in terms of the commercial aircraft, crafts, China will still continue to heavily rely on Airbus and Boeing, and no doubt about that. But, but I think uh, it serves a purpose for the, uh, for the domestic consumption that facing the you know, 1.4 billion people, then everything China has to claim that, you know, Beijing has to claim that it has a locally made comparable and compatible products such as aircraft, but I think it won't change the reality that, you know, for the high technologies, including the manufacturing of the aircraft, China will continue to be heavily rely on the rest of the world. So, Professor, you want to say something, yeah, right? Yeah, I want to say is that uh, I, I think China's strategy at least work uh, because uh, in the G7, we know that uh, the U.S. Uh, continue to you know try to rally its ally on its side, but uh, you know at least G7 come up with the slogan say basically we're not going to follow the U.S. with decoupling with China, but de-risking with China. Uh, every time I look at so this, what's the difference? De-risking. Oh, de-risking is we continue to engage uh, mm -hmm. with China, but we want to make sure there is not you know much risk uh, of the, that they should not want you know what they didn't want. So. This is a, a little bit different uh, than the decoupling means, you know, like we don't want to have anything made in China or anything we sell to China, you know, there will be, you know, a lot of a consideration. So this is one thing I think I differ a little bit from Stephen. But also there's uh, another issue about the China, uh, you know, made uh, aircraft. What is it right now, I think, observe, you know, in the past 20 years and 30 years, Right, we always talk about uh, U.S. complaint about China forced transfer of technology, and then why there is so much cases of forced transfer of technology. The best thing for the U.S. high tech company, I'm not going to sell you anything, so there is no force of, you know, transfer of technology, right? But a lot of companies, you know, this is not from government. This is a, always from basically a pure interest of the company. They said, hey, if we don't go in there, other company will go. So we will go there. And maybe China is like the previous developing country. Like, you know, they wanted to have transfer of technology, but they can never learn it. But China did learn. That's the problem. China learned. And then just like the aircraft right now, okay, maybe 80% is foreign made. But gradually, I think they will say 60%. 40%. They try to pick up. And this is where I think the U.S. Uh, is basically surprised by the, the speed of China picking, pick, pick up with the technology, bef you know, than other third world countries. Because in the, in the past, I think a lot of countries say, hey, we import the U.S. stuff and gradually, you know, we want to learn to do it ourselves. 
but they never did, right? So now you, you find out the company said, we know they're going to eventually get the technology, but if we don't go in there, we miss the opportunity to get the first you know, chunk of the benefit first. And then you know later they will not consider, but that's against the U.S. government's interest. But for the company, they make profit. Well, uh, let me just mm. quickly go back to the G7. I think uh, the uh, I think the G7, you know, this time, uh -huh. you know, hosted by, by Japan, you know, heavily supported by uh, the U.S. U.S. is very successfully to put together uh, something called supply chain uh, resilience. Mm -hmm. we, we we talked about that earlier, mm -hmm. and I I think. To my understanding, the United States policy towards China is very loud and clear. It's U.S. is not entering into the Cold War. Mm -hmm. it, it, U.S. does not treat China as an enemy. U.S. is continue to treat China as strategic competitor. Mm -hmm. And the, the war between U.S. and China are neither inevitable nor imminent. Mm -hmm. Meaning that you know two big countries, the biggest countries in the whole world, will have to sit down to manage its relationship going forward, but there are lots of differences and there are something that can be worked out. So I think that the, the concept of not decoupling but de-risking, or, or in the process of being de-risks, that's actually a creative new phrase of D-E, you know, dash R-I-S-E. I've never seen in myself, myself that this word before, yeah. but I think it means something. It means mm -hmm. a lot that this is not decoupling, but what risk are we talking about? It's, it's more, security risk because economic security is the national security of all the nations at least democratic nations facing china so if we want to reduce substantially the economic uh, the economic risk which is the national risk then we have to have the whole sets of strategies it being implemented not just in the united states but also japan south korea and the eu countries in uk and not to say Taiwan. And also Taiwan. And we have to work that out based on that. I think that is very loud and clear. So thank you for mentioning all these kind of risks, and we will talk more about that area. So Rath spoke earlier to Miles Yu, former principal China policy and planning advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State, currently director of the China Center at the Hudson Institute, and East Asia and military and naval history professor at the U.S. Naval Academy. Let's hear what he says about Chinese credibility and economic leverage. Miles, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework reached an agreement on goods and technologies on May 28th. What does this mean for U.S.-China tech competition? Well, I think it's, it's not just about the um, the content and the membership. The most important thing about the uh, IPEF is about setting standard. Who is going to get to set the standard? Is it China or um, uh, the international standard? And I think that's what the ultimate uh, goal of the uh, of the uh, IPEF uh, launched by the United States. Uh, that was actually the original intention of TPP, as you recall. So um, um, even RCEP, uh, uh, it's, it's the same purpose. So there are some, uh, some very good uh, uh, elements in there, but also some shortcomings there. We've also seen China criticize the US, um, saying that it's coercing allies into targeting China. What do you say to that? That's very ironic because China is coercing everybody. Uh, imposing its own standard onto everybody. So uh, it, it's not about the U.S. Uh, versus China. It's really about China versus the rest of the world. I mean, I think, you know, uh, there are um, rules involved in international trading. That was the precondition for China to join international uh, free trade system. Uh, most notably, the, um, the China's membership uh, um, uh, into the uh, WTO. I mean, I think, you know, uh, it's obvious China has not followed the rules, um, uh, even uh, the rules of WTO. That's why over 50 um, member states of WTO uh, jointly condemn China's trading uh, practice. And it's, uh, it's sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, negation of uh, uh, the rules it committed to, uh, uh, to uh, abide by um, uh, when China joined the, uh, the organization. So... Uh, it's very important that uh, for all members of international free trade system to participate uh, in a way that would uh, um, follow the rules. So that's what competition is all about. Competition uh, is uh, uh, is based upon the premise that all competitors must follow the same sets of rules. China has been known for not following the rules and 
We've also seen China retaliate perhaps to this with a ban on Micron chips. Do you feel this would have a ripple effect on Taiwan? We don't know the exact the consequences of China's banning of Micron. Uh, but I think, you know, it's all about uh, um, when the United States impose sanctions or is ban something, it gives a specific reason. It gives a very, very concrete evidence to support that decision. Uh, China doesn't do that. So it's, a, it's basically it's a very uh, sort of a passive aggressive, almost like a crank reaction to, uh, to outside pressure. And the pressure is good for China to, to, to force China to behave according to international norms. So unfortunately, China used all these uh, uh, issues, uh, this power to sanction as a leverage to force the United States and uh, the other countries to comply uh, uh, with its own rules. Do you feel the U.S. is doing enough as we've seen the White House respond? Or do you feel there needs to be tougher measures in terms of dealing with Chinese economic coercion and competing with China? Well, I think any economic uh, uh, competition must start with something that's uh, acceptable to, uh, to a large uh, uh, body of international community. Um, I think this uh, IPEF is a good start, but also it has some shortcomings. Number one, it's failed to address the issue that essentially competition with China on the economic ground is also a political competition. You must address the institutional incompatibility between China and the rest of the world, number two. Number, number one. Number two is that uh, it's a membership. I think from beginning, uh, who should be the framework um, uh, within the framework is very important. So it's unfortunate that Taiwan is not part of the uh, uh, funding members of the IPEF, who were, uh, while China, uh, while Taiwan definitely deserves to be in there. Uh, that's why over 200 uh, 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 members of Congress uh, urged, sent letters uh, to the administration to urge Biden team uh, to reconsider. Um, it's much easier to include Taiwan from the beginning than, um, um, than admitting Taiwan uh, later on. So, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's a good way uh, to, uh, uh, to conduct business um, inter uh, internationally. I think it's unfortunate that we don't have Taiwan, we didn't have Taiwan uh, as a funding member. Hopefully Taiwan can eventually become a member. Miles, do you feel eventually, will the US and its allies prevail in terms of this competition as we've seen decoupling and we've seen um, a group of democratic allies coming together to build new supply chains? Ultimately, rules-based international system will triumph because uh, nobody, I, 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 I stress that nobody really wants to be subjected to the kind of uh, approach that China uh, is imposed on uh, because ultimately China's uh, 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 goal is not about the fair trade, it's about uh, um, uh, domination. So China wants to play the leading role in virtually every international institution it's a member of, uh, you, even with the, some of the uh, 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 groupings that China uh, created, or uh, uh, like a Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, or even BRICS, China wants to join, it wants to dominate. So that's not going to, uh, uh, to work because uh, each nation has their own um, sovereignty and independence. Um, so that's not really uh, going to work. So ultimately, China is going to basically, you know, uh, to fail. Now, I have to say this. Decoupling has never been a national policy of any government because uh, keep China in the international trading system, there's some pluses and minuses. So nobody's advocating for that. But decoupling is happening not because of national policy, but because of economic reality. Many major companies and economic entities doing business with China, realizing that uh, um, if you don't stay away uh, with the, in a sort of respectable distance, you're going to be basically completely rely on China to be manipulated, exploited by China. So that's why um, um, eventually, you know, um, many companies have, have chosen to basically to move their manufacturing capabilities away from China. So I, I think China is probably desperate right now to, uh, to try to keep everybody in. Let's now talk about the economic framework where the U.S. Commerce Secretary responded to China's trade ban. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, also known as IPEF, includes 14 countries in the region, mostly democracies allied with the U.S. and many of Taiwan's strategic partners, from Japan, South Korea, to Australia. IPEF agreed to improve supply chain resilience as well as security. This was held as a new milestone. 
Chonglun, what do you see in terms of impact on the global economy? Um, if you want to explain um, the um, Indo-Pacific economic framework, we have to begin with um, when Donald Trump became the president, he withdrew from TPP. TPP was an economic framework uh, started by President Obama, and that was considered the most advanced trade agreement uh, ever existed. The Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right, Trans-Pacific Partnership in the Asia Pacific. But um, there's a very strong uh, protectionist coming from the states, so Donald Trump uh, withdrew from uh, before they are signing into agreement. And later on, Biden, President Biden, uh, did not uh, enter the TPP as well. So instead, uh, I think now the Biden administration come up with the idea of um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. This is the framework that is competing with uh, ASEP which is uh, dominated by China. That's another regional economic framework. So we are seeing there are three of them. One is by dominated by China, RCEP. The other is CPTPP. Now the largest economy is Japan. And now there's uh, United States uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. I would say that um, um, for Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, they do not look like a traditional trade pact because uh, there's no market access, there's no lower of tariff. Yeah. They are talking about something else. Um, I think uh, now uh, the first result coming from the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework will be a resilience on supply chain. I think that is a good thing. But in order to have other members to willing to uh, participate and then want to engage in this framework, I think uh, Washington will have to come out with more incentive for them to stay on. I think um, uh, for CPTPP, they have uh, their own benefit to stay on in that. And RCEP, it, there's also some benefit. But for um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, if you do not uh, provide continuous economic incentive, that uh, may be uh, weaving away uh, in the following days. And, uh, and also, I think that uh, it's unfair for Taiwan not to be able to become a 15 member uh, in that uh, organization, because this is dominated by the United States, and it's by invitation. Uh, there's no China to veto Taiwan's participation. So if Taiwan can be uh, a member, that would be also uh, very good for Taiwan multilateral uh, trade uh, diplomacy. But do you feel it's because they did not foresee Taiwan coming with Southeast Asia because Southeast Asian membership would have opposed Taiwan's membership? Um, I think the Southeast Asia members are afraid to participate uh, in the, this organization with only Taiwan, not with China they are afraid there may be pressure coming from Beijing. So and Southeast Asia would withdraw right, if Taiwan right, right. I think that is the reason why uh, Taiwan was being kept out from this, uh, right? So Stephen, in terms of economic significance, how important are these IPEC 14 countries? Well, I think, I think it's just, Jolin just correctly mentioned that IPEC it was initiated by the U.S simply because of the, fa of the fact that because of domestic political constraint within the United States, neither party will be able to put through um, to join uh, or to, to continue the, the route for the CPTPP. So IPAC is pretty much sort of a new version or, or a new generation of the trade pack, X minus tariff reductions and market access. Now. Um, I, I think it's significant because it's number one is an alliance. Number two, it's it's a framework, and the subsets of which uh, will be composed of many agreements. Um, for Taiwan, I think um, that's that's right. There is a political connotation there, so we would love to join as a as part of IPAC. In actuality, I think it might for it might be work better for Taiwan's benefit to have a mirror imaging sets of the bilaterals, such as what you see for the past few days, the Taiwan uh, US 21st century new trade initiative uh, as reflected in multiple or the layered agreements. 
That's bilateral. First time, you know, uh, in, in a few decades, the, the pure BIA, BIA the bilateral uh, uh, investment agreement. We could continue to do that in other subjects with the United States and also use that as a model, mirror imaging, to get bilaterals with other countries, many of which would be the, are the members of IPAC. So there will be bilaterals between Taiwan and U.S., and Taiwan and Japan, and Taiwan with possibly other countries which are members of IPAC. I think going forward, that seems to be on the right track, which is the strategy for Taiwan in terms of dealing the multilaterals and the bilaterals agreements and the international <coughs> existence and presence. Do you mean that going bilateral will be easier <coughs> for Taiwan instead of going through well, the multilateral channels? Particularly, we really were, we're, we're just signing the, mm -hmm. the trade pacts with the U.S. and there will be the second and third rounds of the trade pact with the U.S. And once we get that, and that once and if the content of which have been agreed upon, the group will be agreed upon by other countries, will continue to do that, will continue to use that as a model for the bilaterals with other countries. Mm -hmm. Yes. With, with bypassing, say, Chinese um, obstruction or objection to Taiwan joining a larger well, trade e e pact, Exactly. So mm -hmm. we, we, have, we have the meat, we have the substance, mm -hmm. in, and, and not the form, which is a member mm -hmm. of... But it'll be in different forms. Like, like IPAC. The individual we'll we'll do multiple pacts. bilaterals mm -hmm. as, uh, as, as, as opposed to a single multilateral mm -hmm. like IPAC. I mm -hmm. think that seems to be the way mm -hmm. to go. Right. Professor, I wanted to ask about going against um, Chinese economic coercion and mm -hmm. how to, as you mentioned, de-escalating that mm. risk or mm. minimizing that risk. Do you feel IPEF could serve that purpose as these countries come together and talk? Uh, personally, I, I would say the m most significant thing about IPEF is that the total economy or total population increase, uh, you know, surpass that one of the ASEP, right? If India originally part of this ASEAN plus six joined the ASEP, then it's the biggest block, right? Right now, you know, with India not part of ASEP, but joining the um, IPAF, then this become, you know, in terms of the, the, the biggest block. But it is not a trade pact. We all know that. It is just, you know, if it is a trade pact, then you have to talk about tariff reduction. You have to talk about market assets. So, but could they still have conversations in dealing with China? I don't think feel? so. I, I think what they are trying to do is basically you know, getting together as more politically motivated than economically motivated. Because I, I, I have talked to Americans a lot, uh, and they, they always talk about, oh, the most important thing, you know, we believe, uh, you know, this is part of our tenet is free trade. But nowadays, you know, when the United States feel free trade is not necessary in its benefit or it's in its interest, we find their attitude change a lot. So they don't talk about free trade anymore. They talk about this kind of framework for coordination of, of you know, some of the policy. So I think this is a more like a framework. And then, uh, of course, Taiwan is not in because of the ASEAN country. And, of course, the U.S. has to get ASEAN country on board and hoping that this is more, you know, a counter uh, block against China. Uh, but if you don't have those ASEAN countries on board, then it would, you know, it's almost like a uh, direct opposite of the ASEAN. So by but now that they are on board, do you feel that they could do something if, say, China wants to coerce a country in uh, the region? No, no. I think China would not coerce those countries as long as Taiwan is not in, a member. You know, and this is not really uh, a trade block like ASEAN. ASEAN, I think, has more in terms of uh, market assets or, you know, tariff reduction. Uh, so this is, I, I think China realized this is a politically oriented uh, block that uh, may be uh, responding to America's domestic politics more. And everybody's joining this one, just hoping to maintain a cultural tie with the U.S. Uh, so you can look at this, like if ASEAN countries are all in, why not? The, the backward country, the Chinese friend like Burma, Laos, or Cambodia are not in, right? It's all this, you know, more advanced country in 
in the ASEAN. So, Professor, you talk mm. about the political motivation mm. behind uh, IPEF, mm -hmm. and the U.S. Commerce Secretary also said that IPEF can help the 14 countries reduce their reliance on Chinese products, and also the Chinese Foreign Ministry immediately lashed back, saying regional cooperation isn't about discrimination or exclusion. So, Stephen, do you think that IPEF is really raising eyebrows in the eyes of China? Well, I think so. I think so. I think. Uh, uh, well, uh, IPAC was initiated again by the United States, and the first country that uh, the when the United States have this con have this concept of IPAC, uh, IPAC uh, to to talk to uh, was Japan. So then Japan was on board, and then it start to uh, increase and enlarge the membership group. And I th I think moving along is very cautious. I think I think it's uh, there there as I just mentioned there anything. Anything that, that, that we do regionally has a political or international connotation. China, China of course, is, is watching, but there, there are some meats in there. Um, there's no tariff reduction. There's no um, uh, market access as the traditional uh, multilateral trade agreements uh, uh, do. But if you look at this, there, 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 are, there are some of the things like digital uh, trade, uh, the uh, agricultural um, uh, sections, uh, the new labor and environmental standards, trade facilitation, customs administration, and the corruptions, small and medium enterprises, so on and so forth. And and that, pr the m many of those, actually all of those that I just mentioned, were in the original draft of the TPP before the CPTPP. So so those are there, and and it's just that because of the market access and the tariff reductions are a sensitive areas that in the United States it's literally almost a no-go when we say not free, no free trade, it's actually not no free trade, it's no market, it's no full access of market and the tariff reductions. But if you talk about something else that is still a new generation of the trade pack, and I think China is nervous about that, but I think it's, 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 in, the, in, it's in the initial stage of IPAC. We'll see how it goes, but I think a lot of which have some merits there. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree with Stephen uh, when he uh, earlier said that uh, it's a mirror image of the bilateral agreement uh, that we, sh we have it with the United States, we can have it with Japan as well to constitute uh, the membership of IPAC. But I have to remind uh, our uh, viewers is that um, I think the future, uh, the battleground will be on CPTPP. Mm -hmm. Now that the Great Britain have been accepted as a member, uh, China and, uh, and Taiwan have also applied for membership. And CPTPP, uh, if we uh, paraphrasing as, as meat, they have more meat in there. Mm -hmm. So um, when we start uh, doing all the trade negotiation, you need a lot of personnel, you need a big bureaucracy to push this. Uh, don't forget, we still have CPTPP as our main battleground. So IPAP maybe is good, it can demonstrate our relations with the United States, but if we have um, have think about that uh, in the next 10 years, the U.S. may not be able to enter CPTPP, then uh, that would be the target we should put more fo focus on, right? So thank you for talking about all these trade initiative and agreement, and we will come back and talk more about them. Red also spoke to Alex Capri, senior lecturer at the National University of Singapore Business School and global supply chain expert. Capri frequently contributes his expertise to the agendas of the World Economic Forum. He spoke about how global supply chain realignment is taking place. Alex, China recently moved to ban Micron memory chips and um, the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, responded by saying that the U.S. will not tolerate China's economic coercion. What does this mean for U.S.-China supply chain realignment? So I think the Micron ban in China is just yet another reality check for tech companies and for emerging foundational industries of the future that require semiconductors and, and, and require you know, leading edge technology that is dual use in, in nature. I don't see any uh, any indication that the uh, the temperature is going to come down uh, when it comes to strategic supply chains. 
um, you know, whether or not China in the U.S. and China and, and others in the West are able to come to some sort of competitive cooperation kind of arrangement where they continue to trade in non-strategic areas, but where they will definitely continue to bifurcate uh, in strategic areas. I don't see that trend uh, diminishing. We've also seen Secretary Raimondo host IPEF. What does this mean in terms of critical supply chains? This emphasis on secure supply chains, on um, on on uh, ring fencing, strategic uh, technologies amongst trusted partners when it comes to global value chains, um, is clearly um, the direction that uh, that the world is going. Uh, you know, when it comes to the global trade landscape. Now, for IPEF, there are of course uh, additional hurdles that need to be uh, that need to be cleared, um, and and one of the one of those hurdles is um, does uh, does the additional um, efforts that that some countries have to make to to accommodate the United States, uh, you know, when it comes to their their strategic goals around strategic supply chains. Does that mean that the United States is going to at some point open up its market more, um, you know, to those to those to the goods of those other countries? At this point, there's no appetite for that in the United States. Right. In order, you know, in other words, to link a uh, secure supply chain arrangement with a free trade arrangement, for example, or to throw in those additional incentives. I, I think that would make the, the decision or the, uh, you know, the efforts by others to accommodate the U.S., when it comes to its strategic needs, uh, it would make their efforts a, a, a bit more, um, I should say, uh, rewarding, if you will, um, if there were, in fact, some kind of, um, you know, uh, diminishment of, uh, of trade requirements or, or in some cases in duties. So we'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Taiwan recently reached an initial agreement with the U.S. on the 21st Century Trade Initiative a bilateral trade deal between the two countries. Chonglun, what do you think this means in terms of reducing reliance on China? Um, now we have finished the first phase of negotiation and we have signed the agreement on first phase. Uh, there is an expectation that uh, we hope to wrap it up uh, and finish that by the end of this year. I think that is uh, too much uh, expectation uh, for to, and pressure put on the negotiators. Uh, I think now uh, we finished the first phase and we began to talk about agriculture and labor and other thorny issue on the phase two. Um, if we can reach agreement on a tax, especially um, the double taxing uh, agreement, that would be quite a big achievement uh, for Taiwan. And I think that would really help the business uh, if they want to invest in the United States. As you know that TSMC had a major investment in Arizona. There's a lot of industry want to go there and uh, to become a uh, surrounding uh, industry, uh, to become part of the supply chain. But it now run into some tax uh, issues. They have to pay like more than 10% uh, compared with their Korean competitor. So I think that would be a really beneficial if we can reach a tax agreement. You feel that's in the way. Do you feel that right. we'll get to that? Right, right. So Stephen, you just mentioned that maybe Taiwan should have more bilateral agreements. So do you think that this 21st, trade and, uh, 21st century trade initiative can be seen as a way for Taiwan to make up for our absence in IPEF? Well, I think so. Uh, I think if you look at this, the agreements that are being entered into right now between Taiwan and the United States, it has its forms and shape. It's, it's very complete. It has some substance to customs administration, trade facility, SME, and the corruptions, and so on and so forth. So um, we we we've, we've never seen that before between the, the you know Taiwan and the United States in terms of entering into the trade pact. Going forward, as just mentioned by by Chonglin, and th there will be deep water environmental standard, labor standard, agricultural uh, subsidies. Those, some of which would need to have. Uh, a corresponding amendment to the existing laws in Taiwan. And I think it will have some impact. It will take some deep thought. And I, I think that uh, we'll get there, I think. 
but it may or may not be by the end of this year. And I agree, although it's a separate but in parallel issue, uh, you know, avoidance of double tax treaty seems to be on the rise, and uh, uh, folks on the on the Capitol Hill seems to be on board with that. It's just a matter of time. If we can finish that by the end of the year, that will be a plus to the corporate in Taiwan. Um, and, and then next year, 2024, the remainders of the 21st century trade initiative between Taiwan and the United States, as, you, as I just mentioned, there, there are something else that will be continued to, uh, if, we, if we may, to enter into uh, sometime, hopefully in 2024, and that will set up a very good standard for the bilaterals between Taiwan and the other countries. With the signing of the first phase, mm -hmm. Professor, do you feel that this is a sign of U.S.-Taiwan ties at its best. Okay, if I look only from the economic perspective or trade perspective, I don't think right now it's going to be in Taiwan's benefit, because you know if you look at the uh, the the issues like custom uh, border regulation, and those are not Taiwan's you know best things. We want to have again market access. We want to have tariff reduction, but this is not. But this is the bad thing happened to Taiwan right now because we have a institutionalized platform that you will continue to talk with the U.S. There will be issues. You know, uh, this is the most important thing when you have a institutionalized uh, organization that you have to interact with each other every few months. You know, continue to deal, and that's th the bad thing happened right now. Uh, if you look at U.S. and China relations, when they deteriorate, I don't know whether you still remember in the early 2000s and continue uh, during the Obama administration that there are so many Sino-U.S. bilateral talk, economic one, you know, even the, 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 the education one, they, they did a lot of talk. You have all, all, all different government officials, but annually they have talks. So we don't have that as much. So this one provide Taiwan a regular, you know, a interval regular talk with the U.S. and there will be issues. But in terms of benefiting Taiwan's economy, I'm not expecting that as much. But ma maintaining this kind of dialogue, I think that's the most important thing. So you're saying the talks is not a reflection of the actual relations, yeah. but more on. Mm. Yeah, the talk is reflecting a relation. They have, you know, we are continue to increase, but in terms of substance of economic gain, train trade game. Uh, I don't trust that, that as mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. So Chong Lan, do you agree with what Professor said? And also, do you think, are there any other challenges in this agreement? Uh, I agree with Professor in this and that uh, to have a platform uh, and to have a continuous dialogue and negotiation is a good thing. I still remember um, back then, uh, the TIFA uh, had been uh, put on hold for several years. Mm -hmm. Uh, even uh, two or three years without any contact with each other. And that is uh, such uh, a bad thing for Taiwan. We are losing precious time while other countries are moving ahead with their multilateral negotiation. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.